of what this chapter says to us this morning. As I mentioned earlier in the service, it's quite remarkable, isn't it, what the Lord introduces us to as we walk with him through the Gospels. And here we come uh, to the instruction of Jesus about the last times or the last days. In, uh, in the Christian church, the subject of Mark 13 and Matthew 24 is often called eschatology. It's a good word, isn't it? Eschatology. It's made up of two Greek words. First one meaning the last, and, and, and the logos or ology, a part, a part of it means the knowledge of or the doctrine of. So this is the, the knowledge or doctrine of the last things. So these are the things that will take place uh, between the Lord Jesus' teaching here and his second coming, the doctrine of the last things. It's a very uh, wonderful thing, this doctrine of the last things, that the Lord Jesus would take the time uh, to draw out of the hidden purposes of God, the things that are necessary for us to know as Christians is a wonderful thing. And he does that because there are certain things we need to know if we're going to be able to serve him as we ought to through difficult times. Now, when it comes to this subject of eschatology, uh, there's no exaggeration to say that libraries could be filled and overflow with the books that have been written on this subject. And I don't think it would be possible even to count the number of sermons that have been preached every year uh, in favour and defence of one view of the millennium or another. Uh, there, there is a, abroad in the world uh, different views, very different views about what Jesus means here in this chapter. You've got the pre-millennials, you've got the post-millennials, you've got the R-millennials. But we're not going to enter into any of that. We're simply going to look together at what Jesus teaches here, as is recorded by Mark at this point, and try and look at it in its context and draw from it some evident lessons. So Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. He's come out of Jerusalem. He's finished his teaching there in the temple. And he's come out and he's gone the little distance between the gates of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, which rises up between Jerusalem and Bethany, because he's headed for Bethany. That's where he was staying overnight. So he's there on the Mount of Olives, and as, as he looks back towards the city, looking on the slope of the mountain, there before him is not just the city, but you can see the glorious temple of Herod right there. And, uh, and, and that's the setting. Magnificent temple with its gloriously formed and fashioned stones. It's one of the best and most glorious buildings in the world at that time. And uh, as they're looking at it, he says something that absolutely shocks his disciples and provokes them to ask the questions that we've got in verse 4. The Lord Jesus says to them, You see this great building, or these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. <laughs> and then when he said that, the, these disciples, Peter, James, John and Andrew, come to him privately and they, and they ask him two questions. Lord, what shall the sign be when all these things shall be fulfilled? But before that, tell us when. So you see those two questions? When will it be and what will be the sign? So everything that follows in this chapter is Jesus addressing those two questions. When and what will be the sign? So that's really important for us to see. And, uh, and, and, and then we're going to now look at that. Uh, under the general theme in chapter 13 of Jesus' practical eschatology, the Lord Jesus' practical eschatology, eschatology. There's, there's, there's nothing theoretical or notional about this. It's immensely practical 
And it's all aimed at leading to the point where he can say that last word that's recorded in chapter 13. Have a look at it in your Bible. What is it? Last word in chapter 13. What's your Bible say? Watch. So that's, that's the whole focused purpose of everything Jesus is teaching here. What I say unto you, I say unto all, as the conclusion of all this, watch. So anything, you know, eschatology that takes us away from that purpose of Jesus, I'd suggest to you, is missing the mark. This is immensely practical. It's designed to equip the church uh, with what it needs to know in order to serve the Lord Jesus and to watch and be ready for his coming. So let's look at that. Jesus' practical eschatology. We'll see, first of all, something of the structure and then the equipping that this gives to the church. Next week, God willing, if the Lord tarries, uh, we'll look at the purpose or goal of this teaching of the Lord Jesus. So first of all, with Jesus' practical eschatology, let's look at something of the structure of what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, gives us here in this chapter. The, the thing I'd like us to understand together is that the Lord Jesus is weaving together two great events in all that he says in this chapter. And, and, and the two great events are identified for us in Matthew's account. So if you just turn your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 24 again for a brief moment, I'd like to show you something there in verse 3 that sheds a bit of light on this. So just by way of comparison, let me read to you out of, out of Mark's account and uh, then I'll read out of Matthew and you can see the difference. This is what the disciples say as recorded by Mark. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Okay, catch that? Now, have a look at verse 3 in chapter 24 of Matthew. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall those, these things be? So that's the same. And what shall be the sign, now notice this, of thy coming? and of the end of the world. So Jesus says he's going to throw down the stones of this temple so there's nothing left, and the disciples say, when will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So when we look at what is recorded here in Mark 13, we've got to bear that in mind. This is not just about the destruction of the temple. This is weaving together the destruction of the temple and the coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world. Two great events. The temple being destroyed and Jesus coming at the end of the age. So that's very important for us. And it's helpful, very helpful for us to interpret this passage with some understanding to see that. The disciples' view was that it would take something like the end of the world to destroy the magnificent temple with its gigantic rocks. But Jesus takes these two elements, the destruction of the temple and the end of the world, when he comes and he weaves them together. And, and he uses, now try and catch this if you can. He, he uses the character of the times between when he says this and 70 AD, when the temple is destroyed, he takes the character of that period of time, which is about what, uh, 37 years, and he says, see, see what it's going to be like in this time? And then it's like as if he takes that and he stretches it out, and he says, this that you see here is characteristic of the whole of the last time until I return. That's the idea of it. So he's taking the destruction of the temple and the, and, the, and the character of the times that lead up to it and he's saying, this is what it will be like through the age till I, till I come and the end of the world and then the end of the world will be like this destruction of the temple uh, in 
in the parallel. So you catch that? Take the snapshot of the 37 years leading up to the destruction, expand it out, and, and it's characteristic of all the time that it was between then and Christ's return. That's the idea of it. So in this way, he uses what leads up to and takes place in 70 AD. That's when the Romans marched in under Titus and destroyed Jerusalem and tore the temple to pieces so that there was not one stone upon another. 70 AD. So he uses the time from around about 33 AD when he's speaking these words to 70 AD to prepare them not only for that event, but also to cast light into what the church should expect as she pursues her mission throughout the whole of the New Testament age until it returns. So I hope we all get a little bit of a, a, a glimpse of that. Can you, can you wrap your mind around that and think about that? We all understand something of what we're talking about? So then, this part of the discourse of the Lord Jesus Christ, this, we, we, take it, we take it up there uh, from verse 5. This part of the discourse, this is a bit sort of different to what you might be used to, but I'd like you to think about this. Uh, this part of the discourse is not designed uh, to lay out for us a whole series or list of precursory signs that we should be looking for uh, to show us when Jesus Christ is, in a sense, drawing near. It's, in fact, designed to tell us what the signs are not. There's one sign of Christ coming, and uh, that is recorded for us in verses 24 through 27. Matthew called it. Uh, being a surprising day where it would come like lightning and Jesus Christ would appear in the clouds of heaven. But here, in this first part of chapter 13, you'll notice that the Lord Jesus in verse 7 says, When you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars, don't be troubled. Catch that. Don't be troubled. For such things must needs be because God's ordained them in his decrees and his providence is going to bring them to pass and you're going to experience them. Such things must needs be, but, he says, notice this, the end shall not be yet. So that's not a sign that the end is coming now. That's not a sign that Christ is near. That's something that's going to take place in this period of time leading up to Christ's return, but but don't be mistaken. How many times have you heard or read, brethren, of, uh, of, of predictions of the end of the world because there's a war that started? Um, when, when the First World War started, there were Christian people all around the place who were declaring that uh, this was a sign of, of the end of, end of the world. Christ must soon come. Why? Because... Uh, it's predicted here that there'll be wars and rumours of war. When the Second World War happened, Christian people all around the world said it again. When the Vietnam War happened, when uh, there's rumours of wars today, uh, Christians all around the place are saying, well, look at this. This is a sign that Christ is very near. But Jesus is saying to us, no, this is not yet. These things must needs be, but it's not yet. So it's in fact an indication of the fact that Christ is not right at the door. Although perhaps that's not right. Let's not put it that way. Uh, rather, we should say this is no sure sign that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return uh, today or tomorrow or very soon. The Lord Jesus Christ coming is the sign itself. It'll be sudden, it'll be unexpected, it will take everybody by surprise, and it will come in the midst of all these other uh, events that are taking place in the world, and it will take people by surprise because they will, they will not be ready for it in this particular moment and context. And, uh, and, and, and in that setting 
the Lord Jesus twice in this chapter focuses in on the fact there'll be many false Christs that will come and, and they'll say, lo here or lo there, don't listen to that, he says, because I'm going to come and I'll come out of the blue and I'll suspend the laws of creation, I'll roll the heavens up like a scroll and, and I'll come with great power and glory. So watch. So, so th this is this is the perspective, I believe, that we see here in Mark's account. So, with respect to the destruction of the temple in verses five through thirteen, and uh, the times leading up to it, those times will be very troubled, and they'll be challenging times. They'll be characterised by troubles within and without for the church. There will be deception in verse 5 and 6 from false Christ. There's going to be battles against error and falsehood. Just think of the immense struggle and battle that the Apostle Paul and his fellows had against the legalists who tried to destroy the doctrine of justification. Think of the first 700 years of Christian church history and the great controversies over the Trinity and divinity of Christ. It was just trouble within and without. And then also without, in verse 7 to 8, there's going to be wars and rumours of wars, earthquakes, famines, troubles in the nations and the world. That's characteristic of the time. Don't let it perplex you. These aren't signs uh, that should trouble you. Those things will be the characteristics of the days leading up to the destruction of the temple and the coming of Christ. They're not signs of the end. They're things that are necessary and needs be. The end is not necessarily yet. These are the beginnings of sorrows. And there's much for the church to do while these things are rumbling around her like storm clouds and, and, uh, and, and as the trouble is pressing in upon her. There's much for the church to do in the midst of this. Look at verses 9 and 10. Take heed to yourselves. The Lord's already said, it shall not be yet. There's the beginning of sorrows. Now, take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in synagogues you shall be beaten and shall be brought before rulers and kings. Why? For my sake. For a testimony against them. So what's the church doing? It's preaching. It's witnessing. It's testifying. And verse 10, And the gospel must first be published among all nations. That's the church busy with its work. And so the Lord Jesus is saying, in this period of time, leading up to the destruction of the temple and characteristic of the last age itself, the church is going to be busy preaching the gospel, publishing it among all the nations. And it's going to have to do that undaunted because as you read down there, they're not only going to deliver you up into the councils and synagogues, that's the false church persecuting uh, the faithful, as it was in the days of the apostles under the Jews, and it still is today, uh, as the faithful are in the, in the visible church. But then verses 11 through 13 show that uh, such is going to be the intensity of this, uh, that even your closest friends, your brother, your father, your parents, your children, uh, will even betray you for Christ's sake, because you represent the Lord. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake. But they, or he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. That's, that's the characteristic of the age. So now, here's the point. From, from the point of view that the Lord Jesus is presenting to us, all that is par for the course. And when we suffer for the gospel's sake in that way, we should not flee. 
There's a tendency for the church to want to flee into seclusion and into safety, where there's no engagement with the world through the gospel preached and lived because it's getting too hard. But this we must not do. Uh, the Lord Jesus' purpose here is to show us that in difficult times we have to hold ourselves as a church of Jesus Christ up to the duty of the church as the witness to Christ in the world. And we'll suffer for it. And that's par for the course. And around us there'll be rumbling rumours of wars, there'll be wars and rumours of wars, and the church will be preaching in the, in the nations and persecution will be coming from within and without against the faithful. Par for the course. And then in verses 14 through 20, there's sort of a culmination. Uh, the, this is foreshadowed in the destruction of the temple and uh, it seems to follow an intensifying cycle of tribulation. And there's the culmination in the visitation of Christ in judgment. Now, Christ visited in judgment uh, when he came uh, in with, with, with the, the rod, as it were, of the Romans in his hand and destroyed Jerusalem and especially the temple. No stone was left upon another. And that historic event sort of prefigures and foreshadows the intensifying the cycles of tribulation that lead up to Christ's visitation at the end of the world. In the days prior to the end, which will be shortened for the elect's sake, as it says in verse 20, the afflictions as the cycles of these things intensify will increase so that there, as it says here, there's affliction such as shall be not known from the beginning of the creation to this time, neither shall be in verse 19. There are times, as it was uh, for the Christians uh, immediately prior to the destruction of the temple, that they should flee to the mountains. It's not always wrong for Christians to flee from persecution. It is cowardly to cringe from the cost of representing Christ as we are called to do that. But there are times when Satan has stirred up such murderous intent against the church that the people of God should flee if it's possible to do so. If not, if it's not possible, the people of God should be willing to suffer and die for their faith, as in the last part of verse 12. So when the Romans arrived, this is interesting too, when the Romans arrived to destroy uh, Jerusalem and to punish uh, the Jews for their wicked rejection of Christ. When they arrived to sack Jerusalem, Eusebius, he's the historian that was alive at the time and he wrote it all down for us. Eusebius tells us that the Christians took heed of what Jesus had warned them here in the Gospels and they immediately fled out of Jerusalem and the region over the mountains to a place called Pella in the northern borders of Perea, which puts them out of the danger. Now, it might interest some of you who, who like history uh, to know that the Dutch Reformed who fled from Holland in the 1800s, about 1846, when they fled from Holland to America and set up their settlements, the first settlement they, 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 they established was called Pella. They took the name of it from the region uh, where the Christians fled to at this time, Pella, Iowa. And that turned into the Dutch Reformed communities that are in uh, North America. So the, the Christians took notice of this and they fled, and many of them fled to safety. So the Lord Jesus here has a structure in what he's presenting to the people of God. And I think if we can understand that, uh, it helps us to see what's going on here. So just to repeat, to reiterate it, the snapshot of those 37 years between Christ speaking here and, and, and the destruction of the, of the temple 
is expanded out and, uh, and it's characteristic of these last days. Now, seeing something of that, and I understand we've just touched on it, seeing something of that, what about the equipping that Jesus is aiming at uh, through this instruction? Notice in verse 23, he says there, But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. <laughs> See that? So the Lord Jesus is really focusing the attention of the disciples and us with them upon this. Look, take notice of this. I have told you all things you need to know the implication is. He hasn't told us everything that could be known. He's told us all things that we need to know in order to be able to hold to our duty and to be ready and prepared when he comes. So there's, there's really two components to this uh, equipping that the Lord Jesus is giving here. And, and, and the first one would be that we are equipped beforehand with the knowledge of the character of the times that we're going to have to live through until before Christ returns. That's the first thing. We need to know that. And the second thing would be that we're equipped with the knowledge that when he returns is hidden from us because God has critically important reasons why we should not know it. You catch those two things? We need to know about the character of the times beforehand so we don't become discouraged and overwhelmed. We can, we can hold to our duty. Plus, we need to get it clear in our heads that we don't need to know when he returns. In fact, it's important that we don't. So let's look at those two things just briefly. First, with, with respect to the character of the times leading up to the end of the world. Now, however brief or long that time may be, is not important. Now, from the, from the disciples' point of view, uh, it would be impossible to say that they would have anticipated that history would stretch out for like, 2,021 years. That's where we live, of course. 2,021 years later, after these things were written. But whether it was 2,021 years, 2,022 years, or 10 years after the destruction of the temple, makes no difference whatsoever. The character of the times within which the church is going to live and serve Jesus Christ has been described. <laughs> It's not going to be easy for the church. That's where Jesus Christ begins, isn't it? He says it's not going to be easy. There's going to be false Christ. There's going to be great trouble. There's going to be persecution. You're going to be betrayed and you're going to have to keep preaching the gospel undaunted. It's going to involve suffering. It's like as if the Lord Jesus is saying to his church, get this straight, brethren. You, as you're united to me, your living saviour, you with me shall be persecuted and betrayed. That's the character of the times in which you're going to live. So the Lord Jesus is saying here, equipping us in this, he's saying to us, don't expect good times. Don't expect an easy ride. You will indeed, Jesus says here by implication, you will see me doing great things by my spirit through the gospel. He will build his church. Everything else in the gospel bears on that. He will build his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, no matter how dark the times come to be. Jesus Christ and his gospel will continue to prevail in the hearts of the elect and he will gather his church. And the faithful church is going to be pressing into the suffering and preaching that gospel 
continually through that period of time. But prepare, Jesus is, is saying, to stay the course. Be prepared to stay the course through difficult and challenging times. Now in our bulletin this week that I posted out to you uh, electronically, I, I gave you a little uh, uh, portion out of what J.C. Ryle says in his commentary on Mark. I'd just like to read you a little bit about that as we think about the Lord Jesus equipping us here. J.C. Ryle says, it looks, when you read this, as if our Lord knew well that man is always catching at the idea of a good time coming and as if he would give us plain notice that there will be no good time till he returns. It may not be pleasant for us to hear such tidings, but we need to hear. And he goes on a bit later. Let us learn from our Lord's opening prediction to be moderate in our expectations. Nothing has created so much disappointment in the Church of Christ as the extravagant expectations in which many of its members have indulged. Let us not be carried away by the common idea that the world will be converted before the Lord Jesus returns and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. It will not be so. There is nothing in Scripture to justify such expectations. Now, now this says this, catch this. Let us understand that we live in the times between Christ's ascension and his return. We live in the times of election, not of universal conversion. So let us labour and teach and work and pray. But let it not surprise us if we find our Lord's word strictly true. Narrow is the way which leads unto life and few there be that find it. That, I think, reflects and gathers up very well what the Lord Jesus Christ is equipping us with here. Now, brethren, if, if, if we were expecting and anticipating, uh, as do so many in the church world today, that there's going to come a golden age where the whole world comes under the sway and influence of the gospel in such a way the nations are reformed and they are brought into godliness uh, almost universally across the world, in fact, universally across the world, we will be desperately disappointed. The Lord Jesus Christ is gathering his church in the nations. He's doing it now. Every nation, tribe and tongue, is and will be gathered uh, through the gospel unto the Lord Jesus Christ as he draws his elect from among them and, and gathers the new humanity out of those nations. And, uh, and as the gospel is preached, the Lord will do that. He is doing it. He has done it. And that's what explains that a sinner like me can be preaching here today and, and sinners like you, Aussies, can be sitting here in this church today worshipping God through Jesus Christ because the Lord has done that. We live in the day of election, not universal conversion. So that's a really important lesson for us. It equips us to stay the course and do our duty, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it will be through great difficulties. And the second thing is respect, with respect to the when question. How, how many lun lunacies have you noted over your Christian life? As, you, as, you, as you've observed what's said about prophecies and the end times. How many people predict this day or that day as the time when Jesus Christ is going to return? And people flock from all over the place uh, to listen to them. And uh, on the internet, you, you, you see fellows predicting this and that and doing all sorts of mathematical gymnastics with dates and trying to come up with the exact day when Jesus Christ, Christ will return. Well, 
With respect to the when, the Lord Jesus Christ addresses it in verse 28 through 36 in this chapter. And he says there, learn a parable of the fig tree. He gives two illustrations here, the fig tree and the man who goes on a journey. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When a branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So ye, in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all th these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then he says this, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. That's an absolute statement. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Wow. That couldn't be clearer. Let's just mention for a moment verse 30. How in the world do we understand that? Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Is that saying that they would be alive when Jesus Christ returns? They had to be? Is that, is that what it's saying? Well, no. That's what makes the key that we've sort of used to unlock this chapter so important. We've got the destruction of the temple and we've got the coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world and, and they, are, they are held together and the destruction of the temple is in a sense prefiguring and foreshadowing that last day so that there, there were indeed and, there, and, and it proved to be the case that this generation which was listening to Jesus was still alive, many of them, 37 years down the track when the Romans marched in and sacked Jerusalem. 70 AD. And, and so, and so as, you, as you use this interpretive key and, and you see that the end of the age and the coming of Christ is, is prefigured by the destruction of the temple, it makes perfect sense. They, they were alive. They did see it. And it was a prefiguring of the last day. That's how, how we understand that verse. But then when it comes to these, these uh, illustrations of, this, of, of the coming, the Lord Jesus Christ is showing us here that he is, he is near. And uh, each one of these events that's taking place is, is a little bit like uh, the flowering or the, or the leafing up of the fig tree. Uh, and and as, you, as you see the rumours of wars and wars and you see famines and you see the, the, the great deception in the church and, and, and this is characteristic of the age and, and this, you see this happening again and again with increasing intensity of, cy of cycle as Christ is returning. Each one of those events is like an indication that Jesus Christ is near, that he is coming, that he is near, and that it's even, even at the doors. There's a sense in which every war, every rumour of war, is designed to make us lift our faces towards heaven and say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Every natural disaster of famine or earthquake or tsunami is designed to lift our faces towards heaven and say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Every publishing of the gospel, every missionary sent, every preaching of the word in the nations is designed to move us to say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Every persecution experienced by the true church at the hands of the false church or, or as, at the hands of the ungodly world is all designed to show us that Christ is near. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. The next great event on God's calendar is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important for us uh, to realise that we don't need to know the time. These things show us that he's near, 
But the analogy, especially of the man who goes on a journey and, and, uh, and, and is coming back, his servants know not when, really does emphasize that we don't need to know. And in fact, it would be very detrimental for us to know exactly when Jesus is coming. Think about it. Put yourself in the position, as you actually are, of being servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's gone away on a journey and he's given you all sorts of things that you are called to do as part of the church and the church itself. And he says to you, I'm coming back. And your immediate sort of desire is to ask the question of the disciples, when, Lord? I would like to know so I could be right ready when you come. Well, the Lord Jesus says, no, I'm not telling you when. It's hidden from me. It's hidden, he says it's hidden from you. It's hidden from the angels. It's even hidden from the Son of Man. He's saying to us, in effect, I couldn't tell you if I wanted to. Only the Father knows. So Christ, as the mediator, was not given that knowledge. And, uh, and, he, and he couldn't give it to his disciples at that time, even if he'd wanted to. But he's saying more than that. He's saying, in fact, I wouldn't tell you even if I could. Why? Because if he told us, and he said, I'm coming in uh, such and such a date in the year, let's say for argument's sake, 2031. It'll be in the afternoon of Thursday, the such and such at 2.30. Well, what would we do? Well, we'd dilly-dally about. We'd do all the things that we probably would like to do and just before he came, the church would, would start to get its house in order and, uh, and it would say, well, we better get ready because the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come. It's nearly 2.30. Whereas in, 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 in reality, what the Lord would have us to do is to live Now catch this. You have us, Christians, and the Christian church, to live every moment of every day in anticipation that he might come today. And that if he did come today, he'd find us doing those things that we ought to be doing as Christians. And as this Christian church, he wouldn't find us scattered all over the place, doing all manner of things that we feel that we'd like to do with our lives. He'd find us doing what he calls us to do with our Christian lives. That's why he doesn't tell us. It's utterly important that it be hidden from us so that we realise that it could be any time now in the cycle of these things in these last days, it could be any time in this cycle where we see all the rumours of wars and all the natural disasters and all the persecution and all the falling away and all the heresy in the midst of all this characteristic time, it could be today. So how then will we live? That's what Jesus has got his eye on. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, that last word again, watch. Anything that takes us away from that, I believe is not the eschatology of the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can this, after, this morning give a few moments our thought to these very, very important aspects of our understanding of what's going on in the world and our part and place in it, and how then should we live. Help us, Lord, to realise that this life you've given us as servants of yours is, is of great worth and benefit and is to be used in the service of the coming Saviour. Help us, Lord, to realise that it will be through great hardship that your church presses on and does her duty. And if we're going to be part of that great work, we have to be prepared and equipped. So, Lord, use this message even this morning 
in some small way uh, to get inside our heads and to touch our hearts and to actually make a difference in the way we view our lives and what we're here for and how, that, how we should live. Don't let us, Lord, just hear these things and, and give them a, a nod and a wink and then get back to business as usual. May it be that through your truth, you transform us uh, into the image uh, of your son and into agreement uh, with his mind and with his purposes. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.